Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this month's Group Power Hour. My name is Grant Chapman, and I work in the advisor marketing team, and I'm your host for today's session. It's great to have you join us today. Uh, before we begin, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which you meet today, the Gadigal people of the Euro Nation, where I'm here in Sydney, uh, and pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. In today's Pro Power Hour, we're going to look at the rapidly changing accounting technology landscape. The change that we've seen over the last decade is nothing compared to what's ahead, and it's no surprise that many advisors are seeking a bit of guidance. So today, we have Alan Fitzgerald to give us the lay of the land, cover some grounding principles that will help you in making decisions about the technology that you'll implement in your business, and explain how smaller firms can leverage new technologies for competitive advantage. Now, it's likely that everyone on the call today is aware of Intuit's flagship product, QuickBooks Online, given that it's used by more than 300,000 accountants and bookkeepers and more than 5.9 million small businesses all around the world. Importantly, it includes a number of features that can only be accessed by accountants and bookkeepers to really help you power through working with clients' books, like books review and prep for taxes. There's our leading payroll solution integrated with QuickBooks Online that makes sure your clients' employees are getting paid on time uh, while making SCP and ATO compliance simple. And we also have QuickBooks Online Accountant, which helps you manage your practice as well as your clients. It helps you keep on top of your workflow, manage your projects and tasks, and track all of your time and billing. On the compliance front, we've also got QuickBooks Tax powered by Logit, which is a really powerful online tool that helps you manage your tax and VAS compliance and preparation needs. And one of the key features that makes QuickBooks Tax unique is the ability to import data from various accounting systems, not just from QuickBooks Online. Right, let's get into a little bit of housekeeping. Today's event is being recorded, so we'll be providing everyone who registered with a copy by email. So watch out for an email in your inbox that will let you review any of the content that we've shared or share it with your other team members. If you're having any technical difficulties with not being able to see or hear the presentation, we suggest you refresh your browser, restart your device, uh, or try a different device. Again, it's not quite as good as the live thing, but at least you will have the recording back up there, uh, so there's no need to be, uh, panic that you'll miss out. You can also navigate to the troubleshooting guide that's located at the bottom of the page, and it contains a, a link to an alternate video browser. All right, that's the housekeeping out of the way. On to today's session. Today, you're going to hear from Alan Fitzgerald. Alan has 30 plus years experience in technology, nearly 23 of those just in tax and accounting software. And in 2015, based on demand from accounting firms, he established Practice Connections Advisory, which offers independent and technology agnostic advice to firms large and small in practice management, workflow, tax, document management, uh, reporting solutions, and a whole lot more. He's regularly engaged to write and speak on the accounting tech market by CPA Australia and CPA Ireland, uh, by CANZ, by the Tax Institute, and he's also regularly engaged by corporate organisations to assist in developing accounting and finance technology strategies and by vendors to help in their future product development. Hey, I'll be back at the end of today's session, uh, but for now, over to you, Alan. So I'll try it again. Thank you so much, Grant. It's one of the perils of technology when you're balancing a whole pile of items in front of you, and today's going to be no exception to that rule. So I am juggling multiple technologies going on here. Um, that was a button that I didn't anticipate pressing, but it's being pressed for me because today is a non-technical technology briefing. And what on earth does that mean? Well, a non-technology is that I'm trying to break down uh, what are often described as quite complex um, challenges for accounting firms. There's a lot of jargon, unfortunately, in the uh, in the tech world uh, for accounting firms. Um, so I try to I typically break those down into areas that are, uh, I guess, a bit more friendlier to the ear, so to speak. So who am I? So let me just see if I press that button and it works. Three, two, one. It hasn't advanced. Wait. Check on that, guys, just to the next slide. I'll do, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll do it to the next slide. There we go. This is me. So I have been in tax and accounting software for about 24 years, coming up in 25 years next year. Um, actually, tomorrow is my eighth anniversary of doing what I'm doing. So I spent, uh, I've been about 31, 32 years in technology as a whole. And that started with the com computer chip business back in the, uh, in the early 1990s, um, continue that here in Australia, and then joined Solution 6, for those who are, remember that name, back in 1999. So to Grant's point, my accountant actually suggested that I set up a business to help other accounting firms, just purely based on the information that I've, uh, I've gathered over the years and continue to gather. 
Now, there's a couple of things that you will notice from my particular PowerPoint presentation. So up in the top left-hand corner, um, that number seems a bit high. That's because the slides run in reverse order. Um, now, that's I hate death by PowerPoint, and it's one of the ways that I try and alleviate uh, death by PowerPoint. So today is going to be, we'll either fill you with uh, uh, great joy or great sadness as the uh, as the presentation comes to an end. Um, I'll include a couple of QR codes at the very end of this to connect through to me via either through um, Practice Connections or through the, the latest incarnation of what I've been doing, which is called Only Firms, obviously tongue in cheek. Um, uh, but that is a, an amalgamation of um, three other brains in the tax and accounting uh, profession, uh, which focus in, I from a strategy perspective, we've got Matthew from an integration, pulling all the bits together, Alwyn from a change management and um, learning and development expertise, and Tyler for the, some of those tricky um, Power BI related areas. But today, a bit of a short agenda from my side, I'm going to be covering things from AI, CRM tools, some tools in that AI space to actually take a look at today, um, and, and I guess to demystify some of those elements of, as to what AI is actually going to deliver. Um, there's a couple of areas within the QuickBooks suite. Obviously, today is a QuickBooks session uh, to streamline BAS and tax workflows. Um, but really, I think the first element or the first elephant to cover in this whole thing is change. Um, now, I had a firm yesterday. There are um, eight users um, on, how shall I say them, MYOB. And they said, we're planning to change in 2025 once we work out what the landscape is doing. Now, to me, that's that's way too late. They're, they're going to miss out on a lot of what their um, uh, competitive firms. If we could pop through to the next slide, guys. Um, the reason why that is the case is that as you can see there, this is a great quote from a chap called Clayton Christensen. And the challenge that he says is that it's difficult for existing firms to change because you're very process driven and you can't aim for that disruption because it would completely upset the, the whole, the apple cart essentially as to what would, is required from a, um, from, from a systems and, 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 uh, and processes perspective. So the, to be able to try and rationalize what is, is happening in that marketplace is really, really important because one of the philosophies that I have and one of the many philosophies, if you know me, that I have is that, that it doesn't really matter if you're starting out or if you're an established firm, a business head or you're essentially running an element of a business, you have to create the infrastructure to make things as efficient for you as possible. And that's not only efficient for you, it's efficient for your clients. So one of the things that I like to talk about in these sessions is the fact that your current database is full of the pointers to the, your ideal clients. So the clients that you want to work with, they could be different to when you started the business. And this is really important. I've, I've been going around the country to some um, boutique lunch events. And the, the question I get asked the most is, what are firms doing right now? And what they're doing right now is going through their client base to work out which ones can I get rid of. Because when you started working with a particular client, that might have been 10, 15 years ago, you've moved on, they may ne not necessarily ha um, have. So you need to match what you want to do with what the, the best client outcomes are going to be within there. Now, I will say um, there's a lot of uh, push on advisory. Um, I think my personal opinion is that accountants have been doing advisory pretty much since they turned over the shingle on their front door. Um, if you're a compliance-based firm, and this firm that I con that contacted me yesterday is a pure compliance-based firm, there is nothing wrong with that. Co compliance is one of those golden uh, golden eggs that will keep on delivering because the government keeps on changing the rules on us. So. The, pro the benefit of being a compliance firm and also from an advisory perspective as well, and knock on about, is that the tools that are now entering into the marketplace and have been for a while can actually make it easier for you to deal with those clients. So to process the work more efficiently, to uh, speed up the turnaround times, and then also then, as I said, to identify who is your uh, ideal client. Uh, next slide, chaps. So the challenge with all of this is that it often comes with, um, are we sure that this is the right thing for us? Now, this chirpy chap, he's a 19th century German philosopher called Arthur Schopenhauer. Um, he actually said originally truth. 
Um, and I think we've we've all seen these stages. Um, certainly, if you were around um, when the mobile phone first came into the marketplace, it's like, well, I've got a perfectly functioning mobile phone on my desk. Why do I need to have one when I go out and walk around the place? Um, I'm at the point now at conferences where I ask people not if they have a smartphone, because pretty much everybody has, but if they've got two. And it's become so endemic into how we operate today that it's one of those scenarios that if um, it, it is just a natural progression. Now, we're beginning to see this in with the AI market as, as it were, or artificial intelligence, or as I prefer to call it, assisted intelligence. Now, that is that the take up of that, really considering it's only, it hasn't even been really 12 months from a chat GPT perspective, um, is faster than ever. But what I'm encouraging clients to think about is that a lot of the tools that you already use will uh, will have AI built into those tools. And that's uh, I'll come back to this in a few minutes, but it's important to note that you, you don't necessarily have to run out and change your entire tech stack because it will just be a component of the tool set uh, itself. Because all of these vendors, including QuickBooks and Logit and Microsoft and you, you name it, they're, be, they're working in the background to incorporate AI functionality uh, into the, the tool set. Now, there are caveats. That's the real, that's the thing you have to be appreciate with, um, with, um, with AI. There are caveats and I will come to those in a few minutes. Parking AI just for the moment. I want to talk about CRM, so client relationship management. Now, to me, um, going back to your all of your ideal clients are sitting in your database or certainly your ideal markets for your clients. Sorry, Chapsy, if you could go on to the next slide, it would be great. Um, what we see in that in that in the marketplace uh, is something that I haven't seen done well in accounting firms. And that is mapping out the client life cycle or the, the life cycle of a client. Now, the example on your screen is how the insurance profession do it. So they pretty much know exactly what services, what insurances, what opportunities, what policies they can sell that they can provide to a client over time. And I think this is a really, I have yet to see an accounting firm do this well. In fact, I have yet to see this do it, an accounting firm do this at all. Um, the, it's about mapping out what the expectation is with the client. Because when you think about it, the reason why accounting, or pe sorry, people come to you as accountants is that you speak a very special language. It's that language that they don't want to understand, but they know that they need to comply with. If you're managing a small business relationship, so that helping a small business and guiding a small business or a large business for that matter, um, you're actually managing people's hopes and dreams, right? So when you think about that, you're not doing, you know, you, you, you're not selling your time, you're not selling your knowledge, not selling, you're actually selling anxiety transfer. So it's that ability for a, a client to come into your office and say, I don't understand this. Can you help me with this? Because this is what I have uh, uh, as a goal and this is what I have as a dream. And so you're managing those hopes and dreams. And you can really only do that with collaboration as per this example up here. Now, it's really easy to provide a service like this. All you need is a blank piece of paper with the three to five to six to seven services that you offer as a, as a firm. And with that, you basically say, of these the seven services that we offer, you only take uh, three of these. Did you know that we offer these other services as well? And that's a really what good, easy way to develop business within there. And it's not even doing a hard sell. Because one of the challenges that will set you right now is that when you next have a conversation with your with some of your clients, say to them, "Do you know exactly what we do? Do you are you completely aware of the services that we offer as a business?" And I guarantee you that most of your clients will say, "Nope, have no idea." And it's really that element of collaboration and informing. It's not a sales process. It's basically saying. You're probably getting these services from somewhere else. Um, did you want to get them from me? And that's that's quite simply that. So one of the key things that I always try and re uh, impress on people with this scenario is that if you look at the long-term um, capabilities of what you offer to clients and where those clients will ultimately end up, 
you can actually start trying it out on a handful of your clients. Now, the, the, the ratio that I recommend my clients to use is to start with the 10%. Now, what I mean by the 10% is the 10% that you've got a really good relationship with. They're really, they really love the, um, the help that you provide them and the chatting to them and so forth. Go to those 10% and say, Hey, I have some ideas that I'd like to run by you to work with you to basically based on your goals. Let's see if we can blow them out of the water. Now, those 10%, if you choose the right 10%, they will be receptive to that idea because they know that they're going to be onto something good. They will allow you to experiment. And importantly, they'll allow you to fail. Allowing to fail is okay. All right. But they want you to succeed because if you succeed, they are going to succeed. Essentially, they would what we would call the innovators, and they want innovation. They don't want you just to say, oh, do this. They want you to assist them with, this is how you do it. This is the process that you need to take, and this is where you need to go with this particular solutions. Not just providing, oh, yeah, go go see this guy. He'll, he'll sort you out. What you need to do from that 10% perspective is the, to take the idea and then apply it to the next 20%, and then basically leave it at that. Because that in alone is going to generate um, significant revenue. It's going to take time, obviously, but it's going to ge generate extra revenues. The 70% the of the rest of them, leave that as business as usual. Now, I, at one of these lunches recently, I asked the clients uh, in the room or the, the, the firms in the room, did they actually celebrate paying their clients paying higher taxes? Now, obviously, as accountants, bookkeepers, you're doing everything to minimize um, taxes uh, for, for your clients. But often that may, in the flip side of that means that they actually end up potentially paying more tax because their business is going better. Now, I have to say all of the, those 25, I think, in that particular room, 25 were horrified that they would celebrate their clients paying more tax. I think that's wonderful. I love it when my accountant phones me, phones me up and says, hey, Al, great news, you're paying more tax. And I think that is something that is a goal at the beginning of the financial year when you're mapping out some of these advisory services, that is the opportunity to say, hey, we're going to do everything to minimize what you don't want to pay. But from the at the end of it, I'm hoping that we can crack open a bottle of Dom Perignon to celebrate the fact that you're going to actually be paying more taxes. Now, part of this, if you pop onto the next slide, please. Part of this is then what I call KYA. Now, we've all heard about KYC which is know your client, and that's a, a, a compliance obligation. To me, KYA is knowing your audience. Now, knowing your audience is really important when it comes to um, the information. And this is where we start getting back into the whole concept of what AI can deliver to, to firms. So where I see the, uh, the opportunity is that if you, if you don't understand how your end client likes to receive information, then you're just providing a whole pile of information that they're never going to read. Uh, knowing your audience is really about matching the technology or the uh, how your clients like to receive information and how they are adapting to change. Now, the sad reality from an accounting firm's perspective is that the commercial marketplace, so that's everyone outside of uh, an accounting firm, that the technology investment by companies is far greater for their world than it is for you for the accounting firm world. And that's purely because of the size of the, of the different market. But the, the challenge is, is that a lot of those firms from, a, um, are, sorry, a lot of those companies or small businesses or even large businesses are using technology that's more advanced than, than accounting firms. Now that accounting firm technology is changing and it's changing rapidly, but you need to be cognizant of how you're delivering information to the client. So those to the further of the, of the right of that will want to receive it either a mobile phone or a YouTube video or something like that. Um, whereas the ones further on the left will, will want to receive it in a, in a different manner. Now, this is both external and internal. When it comes to um, attracting and retaining talent, um, the newer technologies will always get the digital native. So the, the, um, the, 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 the younger generation which have been brought up um, living and breathing technology. So, as I mentioned before, compliance was not will never go away because the the um, the government keep on changing the rules. But the areas of performing the compliance uh, will. 
clients are more and more sophisticated than they've ever had been. So we're, we're at a, a juncture in time when it's easy now just to set up a business simply like that. You can set up a business, use your mobile phone, and the only point that you really have to contact an accountant is when you need to do some compliance obligations, be that you know, registering a company, even though you can do that on ASIC, um, yeah, but lodging a tax return. You absolutely need an accountant to, to lodge a tax return. So that whole relationship between client and accounting firm has changed, which is even more important by having the right technology to be able to offer the um, uh, advice in another uh, in simpler way. Now, what I think is going to happen is with AI in particular is, is it's actually going to breach that gap between what you know as a professional and the special language that you speak and being able to give that information in a way that makes it easier for the recipient to understand. And if you make information easier for a recipient to understand, then they are likely to come back and want more because otherwise they're just going in saying, yeah, I don't know what your, the words, I can understand the words individually, but I don't understand what they mean in the context of doing a tax return, for example, um, or like uh, franking credits or you know, the, these kind of e expressions. So like, what does it mean to me in a way that they, I, you explain it to me as if I'm five? And then I think that's where the opportunity is going to be. Let's pop, let's pop back into AI, machine learning, and um, artificial intelligence. Uh, if you could pop the next slide, it'd be great, guys. So there's a couple of examples on this particular side um, slide, which is uh, I call him Bruce the Brawn. He does the heavy lifting. Um, there is um, Michelle the Machine and ultimately Betty the Brain. So what are, what are the differences between the three of those? If you think about it, the, the promise of AI was that it would automate a heap of stuff so that we could actually spend more time being creative. Well, look what's happened. Um, AI is doing all of this crazily creative stuff at the moment, um, and we're still doing the day-to-day. Um, so that the day to day will come, but right now, menial tasks rob your staff of the time that they could be spent on more productive activities. Simply put. So if you can automate where possible, um, that is the, that is the beginning of the goal from a productivity improvement perspective. Now, the key thing to remember about this is not to automate a bad process. Automating a bad process is simply speeding up a bad process. So let's assume the process is relatively uh, smooth. So Bruce the Brawn, he would be the beginning of all of that. So Bruce essentially does the heavy lifting. So he's a robot and he basically says, when this happens over here, do this over here. So if this, then that. Very common uh, application. You might have heard of products like literally if this, then that.com or Zapier or Power Automate, three of the more common ones that you see into in the marketplace. So by introducing robotics into there, when a task uh, or an incident occurs and then you uh, uh, automate it to go on to the next task, you can start to eliminate some of the drudgery, call it data entry, billing, order management, HR onboarding, and a surprisingly an array of other areas. So, but the key thing is, if you're automating a bad process and bad processes are typically aligned to older software tools, then you're just speeding up a bad process. Find out what the issue is and then automate the process from there. So the next stage from there is Michelle. So Michelle the machine basically learns what's happening in the background when you've done a certain set of tasks. And then it goes, ah, oh, you did that before. Maybe you want to do this again. So as part of that, you can start wrapping around a further series or a further layer of automation capabilities on top of that. Now, we see this on day-to-day -day works. If you've ever used Spotify, um, um, Google Drive, or, or not Google Drive, Google Maps to drive somewhere, or um, Netflix or YouTube, they're always remending based on your habits. Oh, you'd watch this the last time or you listen to this style of music. Maybe you'd be interested in this, uh, this style of music. So it's basically adding on an extra element with on there. Now, AI, this is the one that everybody is talking about at the moment. AI right now is ChatGPT, everybody having a bit of fun with ChatGPT. And I will talk later about some of the perils that you need to be very cognizant of with AI. So AI essentially, um, Right now, ChatGPT, a lot of fun to play with. You can just put in some crazy answers. Like I, I put in the uh, 
the song line, should I stay or should I go? And it gave me, you know, four paragraph reasons of why I should stay or why I should go. You know, the clash would be horrified. So you can put in crazy questions and you can get reasonable answers. You can formulate emails. And this is where you'll, they'll, you'll start to see getting embedded into um, Microsoft Outlook, as an example, or into Google Mail. Um, as part and parcel of the system. So uh, Windows 11, it, I believe, will come out automatically with ChatGPT built into it. Yeah, a bit concerned about that, but anyway. Um, but the, it'll become uh, integral to the actual solution. AI then can crunch all of the numbers that uh, Bruce and Michelle have created and start to take over some of the repetitive tasks that are coming there or basically flag areas where you go, you know what, this is... This has happened before. I think you need to be alerted to this. Or a um, someone has used uh, and it generated an expense on a Sunday evening. You might want to look because the date of the expense doesn't match up with a work day. So it, it stops you looking and or having to look and delve deeper into solutions. So it basically um, starts to take the information that you've created that's in your system already and allows you to look at it from a different viewpoint. Now, that's the potential power of AI. Let me show you an example on the next slide of um, one of the limitations of AI. If you could hit next slide, chaps. There we go. Okay, this particular, I'll give you a couple of, just a minute or so to take a look at that. It's a bit of fun, right? That is a classic example of unstructured data. Now, accounting firms have a lot of unstructured data. So what is the difference between structured and unstructured data? Unstructured data comes in the form of PDFs. It comes in the form of um, handwritten notes. It comes in the form of um, a variety of systems from, it could be archaic systems or trust deeds or information like that. So it's unstructured because you can't readily identify where areas are, 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 are listed at. Um, structured data easily, like templates, particular uh, BAS returns, for example, or, or, or notice of assessments where you can identify certain fields and so forth and extract the information out of that. Now, this example that I have on the screen is it, it really just shows the power of the human mind. And this is where a lot of the elements will be difficult for artificial intelligence to take over in time. Um, they reckon, I think, as I said, that it's that the human brain can form some, perform something like 40,000 trillion operations or something like that and hold about three, three and a half thousand terabytes of memory. So essentially, it's quantum computing may get there into the future. There's a whole new generation of quantum computing, but essentially AI is not going to replace you because it's the, but what it will do, and this is where I, I pretend to call it uh, assisted intelligence is that it's the merging of the disciplines. It's the merging of what you have with the ability to generate scenarios, be they uh, hypothetical or um, tax flow scenarios, for example, or, or cash flow, I should say, or even tax scenario. What's the best um, tax scenario for this particular client? Um, and that alone is an exciting prospect. But there are products in the market today that you can adopt that were previously the preserved based on the power that these solutions have. They are tools that you can uh, get access today for the fraction of a cost of what it used to, uh, to be five or not even 10 years ago. So if, sorry, next slide, chaps. Um, AI has truly been democratized. Now here is just a sample of a couple of um, uh, solutions that are in the marketplace there. So you see Dext, um, you think about the tools, not so, it, it, there's a mixture. You've got the Dex Prepare, um, which is obviously from a receipt, pre, uh, pres, uh, and, um, sorry, Dex Prepare and Dex Precision. Um, they both basically are utilizing artificial intelligence to be able to get information to glean the best result for the client and save time for the accounting firm. Same with Ader. Um, same with Expert. So these, these tools are designed to free up time and resources from um, for the accountant slash the bookkeeper, because it it basically allows them to uh, to do results by um, exception rather than by you having to take a look at it. Now, 
the challenge, as I mentioned with ChatGPT, and if you just do one more click on that slide, there's one slight drop down. There we go. That's it. Um, AI is being introduced into all of these, uh, into these solutions and thousands of other solutions in there. That's why AI will just be, right? Right from the moment, the AI will just be. But the challenge with all of this is, and particularly with chat GPT, is that it tends, has a tendency to make up its own facts, right? You've got to be really careful. There's a, a legal case in the, in the US about four or five months ago where um, it, it, it tends to double down on its own information. It can often perform tasks incorrectly, and it often exhibits like tendencies that are more convincing and more believable than previously before. Essentially, there's an expression called it, it, it eats its own breakfast. So it believes what it's already what it's already produced. So if you utilize some elements of chat GPT, it's going to assume that, oh, tick, that was right. I'll, I'll use that in a future ex example. So if you look at some of those tools on the screen, they're already in use by firms all around the country and all around the world. So it's simple tools that what AI tools will be able to, gen to generate are you know, things like bank feed categorization, uh, categorization um, as a really, really simple one. So the key thing is that advisors that, that aren't using AI, they'll be at a bit of a disadvantage, but they'll, it, as I said, it'll just be a, a component of the, uh, of the technology. But the ones who take an active approach to it, I see will have a bit of a competitive advantage um, over the other ones because they're getting work out the door faster. Quite simply is that if you're embracing what the technology can do, you're actually getting it out the door faster. So the key thing that I like to talk about this is uh, pop onto the next slide, please, if I could. And this is the, you have to remember this is that the reason, one of the reasons, sorry, the reason why accountants will never be replaced from an account from an AI perspective is that there's too many variables, and also the right question has to be asked. Right, so they the, all of these tools will benefit what you do, but nobody can ever come to you and say, um, "I need you to do that because it's uh, it's really important that because the computer said no or the computer said uh, right." Now. The key thing about this is that AI, uh, nobody will ever trust a machine. They always want to blame someone. So this is one of the advantages, again, why accountants will never go out of uh, go out of fashion, so to speak. Um, it, it will never go out of, uh, uh, a machine is never going to be capable enough, in my opinion, to give you uh, someone the, the, the right answer. Now, if it does, this is an interesting point to remember. If I pop up to the next slide, please. And it's this chap. Now, this is actually quite an old photograph, um, but this, if you can see, that's actually Richard Branson. Now, Richard Branson, as we know, is one of the world's most famous entrepreneurs. He's done everything, pretty much. Airlines, the hot air balloons, you, know, you name it, trains in the UK. What was interesting is that Rich, Sir Richard only learned the difference um, after being 35 years in business, uh, the difference between net and gross profit. Now, that that is quite a fascinating statement in its first place. So the idea is, is that he had he had all the creative ideas. He 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 had the the gut feels as to what would would do what would um, what, what would work, but was baffled by the numbers. But it didn't matter because he surrounded himself with financial professionals such as accountants. Now. The, the question that I raised about from a, um, a, a Richard Branson, I posited this on, a, on a, 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 pro a program a couple of years ago, is that, and you might have some clients like this, is that even if he could ask an AI machine the right question in the right format, the answer that he would get, he wouldn't know what to do with it because it's producing an answer and it wouldn't actually give him the advice of what he actually needs to do. So he could pose the right question, but he wouldn't know what to be able to do with the answer. So I think that is that is a really important thing to consider and to remain. So don't be afraid of AI as professionals because a computer can never be held responsible. It can also shouldn't be held responsible for a management decision. And that goes back to what I was saying earlier about the fact that you are your specialty, what you sell, sell is essentially anxiety transfer. It's that ability to be able to assist the hopes and dreams of someone 
to be able to build their business and manage their business uh, going through there. You're, you're translators, effectively. So, and being able to communicate that in a way. Now, that is, I believe, your absolute superpower, is that ability to take a series of complex information and put it into a way that people can understand. Now, do you want to pop onto the next slide for me, guys? And I guess the really uh, salient point about this is how you present. This is, comes back to KYA. Know your audience. So there's a couple of, uh, there's three slides on this. If you could just click on to the, the next two. Um, so this is about how information is presented. And I'll give you a, a brief story. I presented a uh, to chartered accountants uh, a bunch. Uh, they were doing a series on um, data analytics and data visualization. And I opened up the sessions, about 100, there's two sessions, uh, total of about 150, 160 accounting partners. Now, one of the quirks that I have is that I happen to speak fluent German. And so what I did was in my opening slide, um, actually my opening three slides, I presented in German and all of my slides were in German. And that went on for about five minutes as I was talking away. And it's hilarious when you think about how the, uh, how the audience were going like, am I in the right room? This is what I, I, I'm not sure where I should be. And then I started in English saying, this is how your clients feel, or some of your clients feel when they walk into your offices. And there was, a, there was actually a bit of silence at the end of that and a bit of a penny drop. And so it's important, I think, from a how you present and represent data to a client that they can talk to it in a way that they can understand. Now, I think this is one of the great opportunities from an AI perspective, because um, accountants love producing these graphs and the big documents full of you know, statistics and graphs and so forth, because they've never had access to that information in previous years. So now they can actually put, as per that diagram, they can put a whole pile of graphs. Green is good, amber is not so great, crash out, red, yeah, we've got a problem here. Um, they can put it in there, and make some visual uh, visual representations, but sometimes it's very difficult to um, translate that into meaningful action for the client. And I think there's the opportunity from an AI perspective, which is explain this concept or explain this report in a way that's really simple to that end to the end user to understand. So that whole explain it to me like I'm five. And I think this is where the this is where the power of AI is going to come into from a, an accounting firm perspective is being able to translate, further translate what you could do as professionals through to what the recipient can fully understand. And I think that is probably one of the biggest opportunities uh, for accounting firms uh, in the next couple of years. The other opportunity for accounting firms is from a work planning perspective, so that management of work as it goes through the pipeline, and from a resource planning perspective. So being able to pose questions through to your system to effectively say, I know I've got all of this work coming on, but where is the shortfall in six months' time or seven months' time because I'll have people on leave um, which is, will all be, the, the, the information will be extracted out of this, the HR systems, out of your workflow systems, out of a whole variety of, of uh, information areas to be able to compile. That's the um, Betty the Brain delivering back information saying, you know, in six months time, we're going to have a shortfall because based on the number of BAS returns we have to do or the number of company tax returns as, as an example. That's where I think that ability from a, a know your audience perspective, as well as a, um, a, a future capabilities from an, an AI perspective are probably the two most exciting areas that I see of benefit to firms. Um, next slide, please. So we're all familiar with, uh, with Microsoft. And if you could click again, uh, Microsoft is probably one of the most underutilized um, solutions in an accounting firm. Um, it is every, I will say everybody. I've had a, a, a presentation where there was about 150 people and there's one person using Google. Um, but Microsoft is, I'll, I'll just state out there, it is the preeminent supplier to accounting firms, right? But what most people do is they open up Microsoft Office, they use Outlook, they use um, Excel predominantly, uh, they use Word, maybe a, snap, a bit of PowerPoint. Um, and uh, as of in the last couple of years, they started to use Teams. 
Uh, Mike, the Microsoft suite is an incredibly, incredibly powerful suite of tools. And it is so underutilized for something that you're already utilizing on in your practice. So if I could give you one tip, and AI is coming into this with Windows, um, Windows 11 and Copilot and all of these other tools, um, I would definitely encourage you to, um, to take a closer look at the, at the Microsoft Office Suite. Happy to help you out at any stage, but it's certainly something that is, um, for what it does, for the investment that's going into it, it is a phenomenal toolkit to have on board. Now we're coming close to the end here. So if you could pop onto the next slide, chaps. Um, there's two elements that I, um, I want you to be also cognizant of is about keeping up to date with what you the tools that you already have. Now, the easiest metric that I have on this is to track um, help desk logs. How many calls are being made to the help desk? To help desk? And there's two metrics that I use for this. First one is, am I or am I, is my team making too many calls to the help desk? Because if I'm making too many calls, it's natural enough that I probably need some additional training because I'm, 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 I'm not fully uh, familiar with what the software can offer. The second one is, am I making too many calls to the software? Oh, sorry, not enough calls. My apologies, not, not enough calls to the software. Because if you're not calling up your software vendor, you're not utilizing the software properly because invariably in a cloud environment, um, the development cycle is such that it's important to, to have those um, to keep up to date with the release schedules. Um, next slide, please. The other element that you need to be cognizant of is a lot of this stuff takes time. Don't expect overnight successes. You'll, you will get some early wins, um, but expect things to slow down, particularly on that advisory say, perspective, if you're leaning more into that, before you can start getting tra traction. It takes time. So don't remember that what I've mentioned before, the 10%, the 20%, and then the 70% business as usual. That's really, really important. But anytime you, you're, you're scheduling a job to minimize your write-offs, always take Hofstadter's law into account. Really, really important. So a couple of takeaways, last two slides, a couple of takeaways. The first one is if you could pop onto the next slide, please. Thank you. So the first one is um, in the next couple of months, inform the team, take a look at what, what's happening out in the marketplace. Um, Think about what the messaging to both your clients internally and externally is going to be. Start doing some research. There's plenty of uh, avenues to, to understand what tools, what systems are out there. There's conferences all the time. QuickBooks have got a conference coming up in a couple of months. Um, you know, it's the ability to talk to your peers. What are they using? What are they, um, have, have they tried something? Did they not like it? Um, consider because of that, know your audience. Um, what your technology platform looks like from a, a recruitment policy perspective, which is really important. And then obviously over the next couple of years, the points that are on there. So identify what what are some opportunities that we get hold of today that would be really, really good and opportunistic. So I wanted to come back to on limitations of chat GPT in, partic in particular, right? Don't share sensitive data with chat GPT. Every single piece of information that you share with this technology is being saved and absolutely nothing is private. All right. So be very, very, very careful with relation, in relation to that. Double check all of the sources. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it just makes stuff up and it looks as though when you see it, the citations go, that has to be right. It looks good. It actually makes stuff up. And, it, and so the important thing is to verify all of the information that you get out of the system. Um, if you're using ChatGPT to create formulas for Excel, and it does, it's very clever in doing that, double check them, particularly the ones that require multi-level um, steps. As, um, so turning word, for example, you can, you can pose a question, create this formula so to do this, or create a pivot table, give me the code, et cetera, et cetera. Again, the, the, all of the information must be double checked and verified within there. Um, importantly, check for copyright issues. So ChatGPT po pulls information from all over the internet. And it could be, uh, if you're utilizing some of that, it could actually well be copyrighted. So you could be running the risk of running copy copyright issues. Um, 
so there are plagiarism checkers we have to have these these days but there are plagiarism checkers out there before you're sharing any kind of content or or documents within there and then identify particular topics that chat gpt cannot handle um sometimes it'll really do simple tasks really really easy but will struggle with um with more complex one and because it's based on what's known as a large um learning like large language learning model um it thinks in the natural language but it doesn't necessarily think logically you can see top left hand corner it's number two i've gone one minute over last slide is my uh, contact details whip out your mobile phone if you don't know what a QR code is, man, oh man, I'd love to know where you guys have been over the last couple of years. Um, but on the left-hand side, it's one for uh, for me, and on the right-hand side is about only firms, which is that um, a conglomeration that I've um, a co-founder of. I hope you got some snippets snippets of gold uh, from that session today. Uh, I am going to hand back to Grant. Grant, any questions, comments? Anything like that, happy to to, to have a chat. Uh, amazing, Alan. Thank you so much. Um, a, a ton of really great information in there. Uh, no questions that have come through. So, um, Alan, uh, thanks so much for your time preparing and presenting today. Um, folks, as Alan mentioned, he's actually going to be at our conference coming up, um, Get Connected, uh, which is held in Sydney. Um, which uh, will be at Allianz uh, Stadium in Sydney, which was recent post to the FIFA Women's World Cup. So definitely come along to hear from Alan. Alan's going to be speaking alongside people like Craig Foster, former Socceroos captain and broadcaster, Erin uh, Milan, presenter, journalist, uh, entrepreneur, uh, Dr. Ben Hamer, who is the chief futurist and head of future work uh, at Creative Cubes, um, and a whole host of others, uh, all, all really trying to help you create a winning game plan uh, and get your tactics, your teamwork, and, and your technology, right? So um, definitely uh, pencil the 3rd and 4th, I think it is, of November in your calendars. Um, and, yeah, come and hear again from Alan. Alan, thanks so much. Um, folks, I'm going to jump in and dig a little bit deeper into technology with you now. So Alan has taken you through a really great framework for rethinking your technology and how getting a tech stack right can really enable your success. I want to expand on that a little bit and look at some tips to build a modern fully cloud-based firm to create a frictionless client experience and really to look at how having those right tools in place makes life a little bit easier for you. Now, as Alan highlighted, and one thing I really want you to keep in mind as you start to emerge from this returns for period is this, this really has to be the year that you become a 100% cloud-based firm. Part of that involves rethinking your tools and technology. Part of it's looking at how you're working with your clients. And then the final part is really looking inwardly and making sure that the way you're working is aligned for the goal with the goals for your business. Now, while you're in the midst of the busy period, uh, every client that you're working with right now, and especially all of those low trading entities, your trusts, partnerships, and SMS separate returns that you're sorting out, if any of those clients aren't using a cloud-based tool like QuickBooks Online, I just want you to remember all the headaches that they're causing you, to remember, remember every additional manual process that they've forced you into, and the hours in your day that it's chewed through and to really promise yourself that you're not gonna be stuck in the same situation for next year's returns. Getting your clients and your firm 100% cloud enabled is gonna be so important in achieving your goals this new financial year. And it doesn't matter if those new goals are growing, diversifying, or really just working more efficiently so that you're not stuck working a five day week in what you envisage as a four day a week business. But you're only gonna be able to realize those benefits when you bring all of your clients and all of your processes into the cloud in a really integrated manner. Your accounting solution, like QuickBooks Online, it sits at the center of your tech stack. QuickBooks Online serves as the hub. It supports hundreds of apps and the integrations to cover other key business functions, including uh, payables and receivables, time tracking, time management, online payments, payroll, expense reports, and a whole lot more. And this is what a really modern tech stack looks like. It's what, what is required to be a modern firm. When you're building your firm around one tech stack, you're actually setting your company up to enjoy all of the advantages automated standardized workflows can deliver. And that's the holy grail of productivity and profitability. Uh, as Alan said before, don't speed up bad processes. You need to get your processes right. Building standardized, repeatable processes for your team to work to reduces errors, but it also means you're serving your clients more efficiently and more consistently as well. It makes their lives easier because you're giving them a standardized model to work with as they collaborate with your company. 
but it also makes the client experience frictionless. And I'm going to come back to that in, in a second. Overall, those efficiency gains lead to enormous time savings, which means freeing up your time uh, or your team to take on additional clients, to concentrate on higher value advisory work, or just to reduce your overall hours work so that you can spend more time with your family. And it should be leading to some pretty significant cost savings too. So it should be a win on all fronts. Now, before I dig deeper into the technology stack, I just want to touch on the importance of making sure your business model's right and still fit for purpose for where you want to take your business this financial year and over the next few years. Technology is an enabler, but if it's not aligned with what you're actually trying to achieve in your business, it's not going to achieve those results for you. So properly defining your business model is going to help you identify the right technology solutions for your firm. You can't begin to know what applications you're actually going to need until you've identified some key business model elements, such as who your ideal clients are, what you're selling, your services, and what value your services actually provide to your clients. So first, in identifying your ideal clients, what you're really trying to do is uncover those that you're best at serving, that you enjoy working with, and most importantly, that are profitable. Keep this top of mind as you're working with those clients this busy season, you know, who are the ones that you want to see come back next year and who are the ones that you don't? Once you've understood your ideal clients, you can really start to build your business around them. And the way you do that is through defining the products you're selling. Now you'll notice I've very deliberately switched from services to products here. And, and one of your goals really should be to bundle up your services and create an off the shelf set of products, you know, client accounting and bookkeeping products. Your services should be repeatable across your clients. They should be scalable and they should support your growth with your team members required to deliver them. If you're defining multiple package levels at different price points, it means you can also serve different types of clients effectively and efficiently while still working with a handful of those most profitable clients in a truly personalized and customized way. Finally, once you're armed with this understanding of your audience and the value you deliver to those clients, it's all about communicating your value proposition. Taking the time to make sure that you clearly defined your value proposition is it's super important. It's ultimately how you're going to attract the right clients, attract those ideal clients, and build a business model that's sustainable and ultimately profitable. When you've, uh, when you've reviewed your business goals and understood those ideal clients and built out your products and value proposition, the next step is making sure that you are delivering that frictionless client experience. What you're really looking to do here is make sure that it's as easy for your clients to work with you as it is for you to work with them. When you've invested all that time and effort into attracting a new client, someone who actually fits your business model and who has a lot of potential to become an ongoing profitable business relationship, the last thing you want to do is for them to churn, to be worn down by a bunch of small but annoying issues that ultimately drive them away from continuing to do business with you. So your client experience needs to mitigate work for your clients and streamline the process of working with you end to end. So it really needs to be at the forefront of your technology decision process. As you start creating that modern tech stack, it has to support on-demand access, real-time data and communications exchange, and have an intuitive interface. And this all starts with your website. So your website needs to serve as the communications hub for your firm. It's where your clients should go first to access their business critical applications, including uh, client accounting like QuickBooks Online, uh, bill payment solutions, things like that. So making those apps easily accessible through a client center portal on your website is one way you can deliver a really rich experience for your clients. One thing I actually heard recently is that you, and this should serve as your guiding principle for your website, is that you should build a platform, not a brochure. For modern firms, the, the website, it really should be a powerful platform for generating high quality leads, for building your brand, uh, as well as serving those needs of potential and existing clients, all while reducing work and, and saving time for your team. The next step in it is looking at your engagement process. Your engagement and onboarding process is so key to, uh, to creating a frictionless client experience because this is really where you're going to set expectations with clients and train those clients on how they'll do business with you. It can be cumbersome, it can be time consuming, and that's why taking the time to standardize those internal processes first is so important. If you want to take that onboarding process to the next, uh, to the next level, tools like Ignition that integrate with QuickBooks Online, can really help with an all-in-one client onboarding experience, really helping you manage everything from the proposals process, uh, helping you with getting paid, uh, and removing a whole bunch of manual admin, both before and after someone becomes a client. So the other thing I would suggest too, is that you centralize your communications in your practice management solution. 
Uh, it's going to reduce double handling of documents and it'll mean that everyone in the firm, once you've enabled the right permissions, can quickly uh, see the history of communications with the client all in one place. And you can use tools like the work tab in QuickBooks Online Accountant to do just that. You can use it to send messages and request direct to clients, uh, storing documents that the clients send back, and reducing the need to track conversations across multiple tools like email. When it comes to things like booking time with you, you, you can integrate tools like Calendly or MailChimp's appointment scheduling tool to make the uh, process easy for you and your clients. Ultimately, your goal here is really just to create a smooth client experience because that's what clients want. And ultimately, those clients that do embrace technology, you should look at those as your ideal clients because they want to use technology to make their lives easier and that'll make your life easier. All right. As you build out your modern tech stack, uh, it's important to consider the integrated apps required to support your business too. Okay. First up, payroll. It's important to select the tool that can scale with your practice. Uh, that's cloud-based, again, making sure that you are 100% cloud-enabled, and that offers a great client experience. So you'll want a solution that seamlessly integrates with your client accounting tools, uh, as QuickBooks Online Payroll does. Um, so definitely take a look at that. When it comes to accounts payable, bill.com really is the market leader. It's one of the most robust tools available and deeply integrates with QuickBooks Online as well. Uh, receipt management, um, you know, a significant proportion of business expenses are paid by credit card or an online banking tool. So it's really important to educate your clients on the need to capture those receipts for ADO, uh, excuse me, ATO purposes. Uh, Dex Repair that Alan touched on before, formerly Receipt Bank, uh, it's our tool of choice to, to solve those issues because it supports, again, deep integration with QuickBooks Online and offers a really great mobile solution for your clients. Uh, employee expense reimbursement. This tool needs to perform a little bit of a balancing act, I guess. It's important to manage cash flow receipts and approval for client employee re reimbursements with a tool that's also easy for the client's employees to use that provides those really robust management capabilities. And again, that offers deep integration with your core accounting solution. Uh, Expensify could be a really great option for you to solve those challenges. All right, finally, your practice management solution. So your practice management solution needs to track all of the work that's going on in your firm, your client work, as well as your practice work, everything that's taking place across your business. And you really need to make sure that you've got that centralized view of all of that work flowing through your firm, visible for everyone who needs to see it. Any practice management solution uh, should tick all of these boxes on screen from managing your client requests and keeping track of communication to organizing your team's work, uh, QuickBooks Online Accountant gives you visibility over anything that's happening with your firm or with your clients. If you haven't actually had a look at the work tab in QuickBooks Online Accountant for a while, I definitely uh, encourage you to do so because it's actually grown into quite a powerful practice management solution on its own. If you do have more complex needs, uh, one of the strengths of the QuickBooks suite uh, is that it um, you know, really kind of builds in uh, around your firm and it's flexible and has all of those integrations that you can plug in. And the integration that we have with Carbon is actually really powerful. If your firm does reach that size, if your needs and workflows become quite sophisticated, you can make that move to Carbon, taking care of the running of your firm while still enjoying all those benefits through QuickBooks Online uh, for your clients and uh, other tools like QuickBooks uh, Tax provide for your firm. So folks, as you do start to consider or start to rethink what your cloud-enabled uh, firm is going to look like this year and into the future, I definitely encourage you to take another look at the tools in the QuickBooks suite. As I've just highlighted, we've got some really powerful practice management tools at your disposal to track all your jobs, record where you're spending your time, send out fixed fees, pay your team, even manage your own books, all in QuickBooks Online Accountant. With QuickBooks Tax, powered by Logit, you can streamline your tax and BAS preparation and lodgement uh, workflow with powerful automations, integrations, and calculators. And when you combine it with our firm ledger solution, the time and cost savings that you can start to realize for those low trading entities, those uh, SMSF, partnership and trust returns I mentioned earlier, it really makes it an incredibly cost-effective and powerful solution for your entire firm. And of course, at the heart of the QuickBooks suite is QuickBooks Online, the winner of Can't Start Blue's 2022 Best Rated Accounting Software we saw QuickBooks, Zero, and MYAB rated on ease of use, value for money, uh, ease of integration, reporting, functionality, and customer service and customer satisfaction. And QuickBooks was actually the only solution that scored five stars in each of those categories. So as you are starting to rethink your tech stack, rethink uh, QuickBooks, it's a really a suite that offers a whole of firm capability. 
uh, for seamless integrated end-to-end -end workflows. Thanks, we are bang on time. Uh, thank you so much for your time today, Alan. Again, thank you very much. Uh, keep out, uh, keep an eye out for an email in your inbox tomorrow where we'll have information on Get Connected in Sydney uh, at the very start of November where Alan will be back uh, presenting. Uh, and join us for the next Prop Hour in September. Thanks so much.